Hello, I'm Joshua, and I'm an INTP, and first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for viewing this video and subsequently visiting my channel. Uh, the, topic of this video, the topic of this video is going to be on what I think about INFJs personally. And the reason why I decided to make this video is because, you know, I get comments on my past INFJ videos that are very mixed in their reviews. And I'm not sure whether or not people know that I don't dislike INFJs and that I also don't think that there's something wrong with INFJs. Though I've gotten comments where it seems like people are indicating that my analysis would seem to be making it seem as if I think there's something wrong with INFJs or there's something bad about them. I tend to think they're just humans like everybody else. I think they're funny, little, interesting human beings, but I tend to think that they're people like everyone else, no good or no, no better or no worse than anyone. I prefer spending my time around them, actually, as individuals. Um, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm dating an INFJ. I am, I may, I'm most likely going to marry this person, so I'm going to marry an INFJ. I'm not somebody who dislikes INFJs. <laughs> like, that's not me. Now, just because I never talk about myself personally or in my personal life, that doesn't mean <laughs> that you know something about how I feel personally about mm -hmm. anyone or anything. That's just not, I don't know why people assume that. You know, I mean, just because you hear me say, hi, I'm Joshua and I'm an INTP and I think such and such and such and such about a general topic does not mean you know exactly what it is I think or feel about the entirety of the subject or the issue. How I am on YouTube is how I am on YouTube. I'm not saying I'm an inconsistent person because I'm really not. Same person I am on here is the same person I am in real life. Uh... That's why I'm hit or miss with people. Either they like me or they don't like me. But it's the case that whenever I'm talking about something that's, you know, involving some topic or some subject or something like that, you're not dealing with my personal things. Even though they're my ideas and an INTP's ideas are subjective, I'm not, I didn't come up with all of those things from the standpoint of, I'll put it like this. So especially when it comes to MBTI, do I read MBTI literature? Meaning do I, I mean, I've read a lot of books on MBTI and, I, and I've read all the articles on um, all the free available ones on uh, personality um, or celebrity types. And I've read articles on personality junkie and uh, things like that. But where does the bulk of my ideas and thinking about personality come from? Well, let me just introduce you to some things. So I don't know if anybody has read E.O. Wilson's The Social Conquest of the Earth, but this is something I draw from. I don't know if anybody has read Human Variation, but this is something that I draw from. I don't know if somebody has read Effective Neuroscience by um, Yak Pinksa, but this is also something I draw from. How about Our Good Old Behave by Robert Sapolsky? I mean, I have... So, what I'm trying to illustrate is this, that... Or The Divided Brain by Ian McGillcrest, or Flow by Mihai Chinksink Mihai, or The Moral Animal... Um, where is it? Uh, let's see. Uh, the, com the, uh, complete, uh, world of human evolution. I mean, I think people know at this point that I'm a naturalist. Um, Good Natured by Franz Duol. The Evolution of Beauty. And the Archaeology of the Mind by Yak Pinksa. Now, do these things make me a neuroscientist or a psychologist? No, they don't. They just make me a nerd, okay? 
have, are there other things, other books that I have that I have not read? And I, yes, that are on similar topics. Yeah. Um, but I don't get time to, uh, get to those things because I'm a math and, um, physics major. So, you know, be that what it may. Um, but my point in showing all that is this, that look, I'm not a topologist. Like, you know, whatever I think about INFJs, and I guess, like I said, this is about INFJs. This should be about how I think about topology in general. Whatever I think about topology, it's not localized to topology. Not localized to topology whatsoever. Uh, functions and all that stuff, that business, not here. <laughs> okay, why? Because I care to understand human beings. And topology is one way in which I can understand human beings. It's one way I can think about them, you know. But I tend to like to think about things from a very broad general standpoint and i find that topology is not the broadest general standpoint to think about people from it can't explain a lot of things it can't explain why human beings form addictions it can't explain why all human beings seem to have similarities in terms of the overall way in which they experience affects or emotions it doesn't really explain for that it also doesn't explain why it's the case that even though all brains are organized in the same way for the most part, assuming people are neurotypical, you know, if they're not, well, you know, if you're not, but I'm saying that for most people, even people who, well, okay, whatever, I'm just gonna keep it there. For most neurotypical people, all of our brains are organized in fairly similar manners. There's not, it's not exact, but there's not a great deal of variation from brain to brain in any person and the same um, neurological substrates that help one person make a decision are the same ones that help another person make the same set or type of decisions. There's not that much difference in people, yet you have something like personality and you have it the case that you have personality supposedly that are thinking types and personality types that are feeling types. But if you know anything about, you know, neuroanatomy and just how emotions in the brain operate, um, I mean, just to say, I know there are people who are not a fan of my, my uh, materialism, but whatever. Look, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that whenever I try to think about why things look the way that they do, it never seemed to be the case that MBTI could explain it for me. You know, even with the uh, cognitive functions and the shadow functions, it just seemed, there just seemed to be a lot left that it could not explain. And so I move away from things that just can't seem to answer the questions. Now, could anything really in its totality answer all of the questions that I had and things that I'm curious about? Hell no, because I own multiple books. <laughs> that should tell you, <laughs> like, not the theory doesn't exist. Like, the model I'm looking for doesn't exist in the world. So what do I do? I invent it. Does that mean it's like a good thing? No, not necessarily. That does not, that does not mean that at all. That's why whenever I'm saying things, I always say what uh, I like. For instance, now I showed you the title of the books. I say the comment. Uh, or I, 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 I comment the phrase in the absolute precise technical sense. You know why I comment it in the absolute precise technical sense? Because I want you to be able to look it up. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Partly why I can't tell you what paper I got it from is because there's too many on my damn Google Drive. And two, I'm just not, I don't have the technology where I can sit on my computer, pull up the damn thing, and then look and all that stuff. Like, I'm not, I don't have it like that when it comes to my technological sophistication so it's the case that you know when it comes to whenever i'm explaining my ideas i am making it all up like from a very 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 literal standpoint it is all just things i'm making up is it all original to me no and i don't i don't hope i don't ever try and present things when something is completely original to me you'll know and I, there are some, there are things on YouTube that are just completely original to me in terms of the videos I make. But in terms of constructing those ideas, no, not the material. The material is not completely original to me, which I think other people, I think most people know. But the point I'm making about all of this stuff is that even though I'm making this all up, you can look it all up. <laughs> like you can do it for yourself and you can argue with it. It's very much so falsifiable. And, you know, 
to me that matters for something now well it matters for a lot that matters for something and you know it's important now is it the case that the only thing that informs my thinking is um uh, psychology no there's a lot of philosophy that goes into it you know i read a lot of i've read a lot of philosophy and i read a lot of philosophy still so there are things i'm just pulling it from multiple sources but the point i'm trying to make is that it's not M- mbti <laughs> like you know i mean michael pierce was fairly inventive with what he was doing with his channel in terms of his overall reorganization of topology but I would say that what I'm doing is not really topology even. I'm not, it's just psychology, you know, but I tend to speak in a language that many people can understand. And maybe that's my fault for using terms like INFJs and INTPs and all that stuff and INTJs and INTJs and so on and so forth. Because I, and ENFPs, because I would hope that one thing that people are getting though i haven't made a video on types in a very very long time one thing that people are understanding from these videos on types is that i tend to have a very very broad perspective on this thing and i'm not talking about any type as a type isolated from human nature or what it means to be human i don't ever think that that's a real thing i don't think that there are personalities that are independent of human nature or that personalities can differ so much from one another that they don't have some of the base same aspects and principles to their ideation and thinking because to me that there's just no empirical evidence for that there's no empirical evidence for most people being that different from one another though you know, there are differences in people. And that's why I always talk about trait distributions <laughs> across populations or population genetics. I have a book on it. <laughs> that doesn't make me an expert or anything like that. But there's a reason why I talk about those things. You know, um, I have several books on population genetics. Um, and I was a part of a population genetics, uh, population genetics research lab, bioinformatics. Did that for a little while. So, I mean, I just have some ideas about these things. That's all I'm saying. They're all, it's just all crap I'm making up. Now, is it crap from the standpoint that I haven't seriously studied or thought about these things? No, no, it's not crap from that standpoint. But is it crap from the standpoint that you're going to find a bunch of people to agree with me or that you're going to find this in a textbook somewhere? You're going to find certain things in textbooks and probably when you look in those textbooks, you're going to think, yeah, this thing, you know, she just doesn't seem to be saying the same thing he's saying. (laughs) and there i know that you know like i know that and that's why i'm saying it the way that i'm saying it because i don't agree you know like i don't agree but i would say that i'm not also presenting my ideas as if they're truth so i'm going to be very particular about the way i phrase this because it doesn't mean that i'm not trying to be accurate and it doesn't mean that i'm not trying to come to the truth but let's be very frank i'm trying to come to the truth that doesn't mean i have it you know and i think that that's a very 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 big difference between how i'm presenting things or making my videos versus how other people are presenting things or making their video or their videos because this is not a how-to channel it's not an information channel even though i talk about a lot of information and things like that i'm not trying to inform you about something specifically in terms so for example math videos that would be an informational video why would a mathematics video be an informative video because you can prove things in mathematics and because you can prove things in mathematics there is a way that it can be demonstrated that this is true in the case always you know this is that's exactly and precisely what it is the once you actually have a theorem in mathematics a conclusion has been arrived at and thus that conclusion can be disseminated And people can take it and do whatever they want with it. It's just completely applicable to whatever cases that was it was defined for. You know, there's a lot of things that go into it. But you know that whenever you're dealing with the fundamental theorem of algebra, whenever you're looking at a polynomial, it applies to it. So, you know, like that's the deal with math. But when it comes to and so if I were putting on math videos and I think yeah I'm doing information 
or educational videos or something like that. But when it comes to these things on philosophy or psychology or something like that, no, I don't think it's educational. I don't think it's informative, even though people gain facts and, you know, maybe insight into some things about the scientific method or something like that. It's not, that's not what this is about. This is about people thinking. <laughs> that's what this is about. Because that's all I do, I think. And so I'm presenting ideas in such a way that I hope it encourages people to think. And I also know that I present things in a way that are that may not be easy for everybody to understand. And I also know that I present things in such a way that they may be shocking or offensive or prickly or barbsome to people. But that's intentional. Why is that intentional? Because, well, I'm not under the impression that human beings are rational. So that's one thing that, I mean, I uh, believe that human beings are not rational. There's no such thing as a rational animal. Um, two, I think because human beings are not rational and we're social creatures first, we're interested in satisfying a certain set of emotions that pertain to our social drives. And some of the consequences of those interests have things to do with that. We don't really like to change our minds. And we don't really like to have it be the case that we're sh shown to be foolish or embarrassed or something like that. Um, we also don't like it whenever things don't agree with how things are already established in our minds or our heads. I mean, that's a that's a reality. Now, that's also why I'll consider a lot of different arguments, even if, you know, I've already thought about them or, you know, I don't agree with them. Because I know, even with myself, I'm still human, man. Like, I, I'm very aware of my humanness, you know. That's why I'm willing to argue things with people, and that's why I'm opening to open to listening to people and discussing things with people. Because God, if I know what you know anything really is, I'm figuring it all out just like anybody else. But my analysis of human beings in general is we tend to feel as if we have it figured out when we have not really done any thinking at all, and that's what I would characterize the status of most <laughs> most <laughs> knowledge in uh, the human landscape. Whenever I look out on the landscape of human knowledge, I even though I own a lot of books, I own a lot of books. I mean, I own a lot of books. Let's just do a tour. Let's just do a tour. Just quick, brief, brief, brief tour. Brief tour. Brief. 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 There we go. Brief. 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 You know, brief. Just, there it is. I'm an intellectual being. So it's not like I have a problem with owning books or reading or knowledge or something like that. It's not like, oh, there's some over here, some right there, 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 some right there. You know, there's, well, I showed all those, but still, you know, it's like, I'm a, you know, I'm an intellectual. I have no problem. I have no, I have no issues with reading and knowledge and things like that. But I also tend to notice, because I read a lot of things, that there is a lot of competing information in the world. And I also tend to notice, because I, I read a lot of things, and I'm also uh, currently going to school and things to be a mathematician and a PhD, I also tend to notice that facts change all the damn time. <laughs> like, all the time. <laughs> All the time. It's not if they do, it's when and why. <laughs> That's the only question you ask with facts. And I tend to also notice that, you know, when it comes to knowledge from any general standpoint, I also, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I studied theology for two years at uh, Westminster Academy in um, uh, Escondido, California, when I was living there. Um, and so I didn't get a degree in theology or anything like that, but it, I'm just saying that Whenever it comes to my evaluation or appraisal of something, it's not just like I want to disagree with something or I dislike things. Though there are many things I dislike, you know, though there are many, you know, there I'm human just like anybody else. But I just think I'm very, very, very aware of my humanity and the way in which I will play bad thinker. You know, I don't like I don't like playing bad thinker. That's just not a game I'm 
particularly comfortable with playing. I like to play the game of Good Thinker. And part of playing the game of Good Thinker is very much so being, um, I think, from my standpoint, a pessimist when it comes to epistemology. You know, I just have little faith in knowledge. Like, it doesn't mean I don't think, and it doesn't mean that I don't read and I don't, you know, I guess, do my due diligence and study and things like that, nor does it mean that I'm averse to practicing things, but it certainly means that, you know, I'm just not as convinced about things as other people. I'm not convinced, you know, even of science completely, not convinced, not convinced of anything. Why? Because it doesn't seem like anybody's arrived at any conclusion that is, okay, so I'd put it like this, all right, so we've had, you know, I don't know how long philosophy has been going on for at least 3,000 years or something like that. You know, there are still open problems in philosophy. You know, there are still um, uh, propositions. Well, so it's like this. If you read a lot of philosophy, you'll notice this, that one philosophical school will rise up and it will think it will have the truth. Then another one will rise up or an individual will rise up and tear that one down and sufficiently demonstrate why that previous one was dumb or just was illogical or not what it said it was at the very least. It just wasn't consistent with itself. Let's just put it like that. And that will happen for all of the history of ideas such that whenever you're trying to figure out, all right, well, what is morality and what is ethics or something like that? It comes down a lot to people's preferences, at least in this present day and age. It doesn't seem to be the case that anybody's really, 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 really solved many of the philosophical issues that have been with us for at least like 300 years. Now let's give a gander over to mathematics. Now mathematics is an extraordinary institution. I'm not saying it's not. I love mathematics. But I'm going to say this. Look, for all of the progress that there has been in mathematics for centuries, there are still very, very, very many open problems in mathematics. Some of these problems you can win millions of dollars for solving. But that's not because, you know, people haven't tried, and that's not because it's not the case that people haven't been interested in actually understanding mathematics or, you know, solving these open problems and filling, filling all these little gaps and holes and, and quandaries and so on and so forth in the field. It's just that human beings are not rational, you know, I know a lot of times that makes people think we need AI to do our math. I think, no, that means we need to understand our nature better and realize that we're not exactly interested in the truth. And I don't know when it's going to be the case that people, and that's the one thing I'll miss about the Bible. At least the Bible had it right. Human beings don't care. <laughs> like, they don't care. Not on their own. It doesn't seem like they do, you know, not unless there's an interest for doing so, you know, they got to have some problem that they're trying to solve for some goal. That's when they'll care. But I would say that whenever I look at YouTube or the landscape of YouTubers, I do, I, oh, okay, so I'll finish the thing with the math and then I'll say what I, I think right here. Well, some people may think that that means we need AI, but I think that that means we need to realize that, you know, whatever we're doing whenever we do something say mathematics so i tend to agree with nietzsche in this sense you know though i'm not a nietzschean i tend to agree with nietzsche in this sense i am very skeptical of people's philosophy i tend to think that when people are thinking whatever they're doing it is not trying to arrive at the truth you know because and i'll explain why i think that you know and I mean, Nietzsche is not the only philosopher to say this or anything like that. I don't want to be the fact that I'm using Nietzsche. I say Nietzsche a lot to make people think that Nietzsche is the only philosopher I read or something like that. But I just tend to agree with his analysis on this topic because, you know, I've read a lot of philosophy. And it seems like whenever somebody arrives at, it seems like this, that uh, take Kant, for example. Now, I like Kant and as a philosopher and everything like that. I don't dislike him. I wouldn't say he's my favorite philosopher or something like that, but I do appreciate at least his endeavor, you know, what he was really trying to do. I think, whatever. Anyways, so I, I appreciate him, but when it comes to his, I guess, analysis of uh, reasoning, I don't agree with Kant because Kant, 
made up a lot of things, it seems like. And where he got his thinking from seemed to be more of a case of self-appreciation rather than an accurate description of what human beings are. And I don't think you need um, psychology or cognitive science or neuroscience to know general things about human nature and human reasoning. For example, I do not think, you know, Aristotle is the one who called man the rational animal. And I don't think that mankind is very rational. I don't think we're, I would agree with him that we're an animal, but rationality seems to be something we can do. And again, I would say that Aristotle was mostly appreciating Aristotle. He was not not very much paying attention to all the rest of the things in the world for various reasons, you know, maybe it wasn't even possible for them, who knows, but I think that we have more of an interest as human beings, you know, Aristotle to me is a genius, Kant is a genius, um, not just from, not from an IQ standpoint, but from the standpoint of their actual achievements, their geniuses, from the standpoint of IQ, well, I mean, if we're guessing, theirs was relatively high, they're probably m more on the end of highly intelligent human beings. You know, they're some of the most highly intelligent human beings to ever come about. You know, I'm not saying that they're not any of these things, but I'd say that there's something very real about human nature that is not exactly a disinterested thing. I say human beings are the interested animal. They're always interested. They're never disinterested in what do I mean by that is that interest can take many, many shapes and forms, but it's always centered towards something. And rarely is that interest centered towards something like truth. Because what is truth, fundamentally? Is it an abstraction? Is it something that exists in the real? Whatever it is, I know that it's better to try and approximate whatever that thing is rather than not. And I don't think that even when people think they're doing that, that that's what people are really up to, because I just have experiences, experiences, I suppose, and I've read a lot, and I've just noticed that even philosophy as a history has had its, you know, waywardness with reasoning and being rational, go figure, you know, and physicists aren't rational people. Mathematicians aren't rational people. They don't seem to be irrational. I've not met one. I've met a lot of physicists and mathematicians. And I've not met a person I ever have felt or thought that they were indeed rational. No matter how intelligent they are. Um, which I think is, again, a problem. You know, not saying that the answer to life is rationality. Because I'm not rational. But I tend to get things in the right categories. That doesn't mean I tend to get things right now or the appropriate categories for what I can appraise right now or understand right now. The reason why I do this is because I'm not under the impression that I'm a rational person. I'm not under the impression that I can just arrive at the truth. I'm not under the impression of any of these things. I don't think these things. They don't seem to be true. Maybe they're true for other people. They're not true for me. And I haven't seen them be true for any other person I've encountered, whether that's throughout history or in local interactions, I suppose. That doesn't mean that that's exactly, you know, for what it's worth, the truth. But, or that's objectively the case. You know, there may be one rational person in the world or something like that. I just haven't met them. Or I don't know. But I would just say this, that whenever... I don't know. So my YouTube channel, what is it about? You know, really, what is it here for? It's just here to be, I guess, contrarian. You know, if I have to give it a definite um, uh, stamp. Because look, you know, I watched MBTI videos and I thought this stuff right here just doesn't work. <laughs> okay. It doesn't explain anything about what people experience, you know, Maybe people can, for a lot of reasons, psychological ones, say, yes, I fit in this category and so on and so forth. Because people are vain, I think, and it's the case, vanity is an aspect of human emotion. And it's the case that whenever something tends to be popular, in some way it appeals to human vanity. 
And I think that that's very true about topology, which is why I think one of the most egregious things about topology is that it convinces people that they're very different from one another. Even if there are a lot of differences from an INFP and a ISTJ and some or something like that, I'm here to, I hate to break it to you, just the neuroscience and the cognitive science and just a lot of other things say that there is less difference in people than there is similarity. In fact, whenever we look at our genes, it's just a very, 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 very minute amounts, amount of differences that lead to cascading effects in terms of perception and phenotypic expression. And I'm not saying phenotypic variance isn't a real thing, but I'm saying that in terms of our emotions, our motivations, and the general way in which we tend to reason and come up with ideas, and this is what Carl Jung was keying in on when he was talking about the collective unconscious, it's not that different, you know? Even if there are differences, if you were to, and I suppose you have to understand it like this, if you were to look across the stretch of time, and if you were to look throughout a population, whatever, in whatever region you're looking at, you would not find very much variation from person to person or from group to group if you just coalesce them all in a group. Statistically and experientially, it's like this, okay? So that's what you tend to find. Now, if you go in each of these groups and then you start measuring people for individual characteristics, you're going to find a lot of variation. So if you ask how open is this person next to this other person, you're going to find variation. Now, for a lot of people, you're not going to find really that much meaningful variation. But for some people, you're going to find a lot of meaningful variation that makes this person strange, you know, or weird or something like that. And I'm not under the impression, just because I call some types weird or something like that, I'm not under the impression that I'm a normal person. <laughs> like, I'm not under the impression that I'm typical. I don't think I'm typical. You know, I have a lot of reasons to not believe that I'm typical. But that doesn't mean I think I'm very different from other people. And I mean, I hope people see the distinction. There's a difference in being, having a varying trait disposition from another person or having a different personality than another person, or maybe a different set of cognitive attributes than another person. But don't ever let the fact that you have all these differing personality features or cognitive attributes convince you that you are a different kind of human being than those people. Because there's only really one kind of human nature. There's only really one kind of human, really one kind of human being. And <laughs> that's all we're looking at, and that's all we're dealing with. You know, nature is very, I suppose, convincing in terms of making us feel as if we're very different from one another, but we're not very different from one another. From a completely biological standpoint. That doesn't mean cultures don't differ in things like that. There is a lot of variation in culture and ethnicity, not necessarily race, but ethnicity, the marriage between race and culture. There's a lot of variation in that mess, but when it comes to the human animal and personality, it's just not very different, you know? It just doesn't differ. Um, and so, you know, that's to me partly why I don't like, I don't, I didn't like topology, you know, even though I found it interesting. I didn't like it because I felt like it was misleading. Um, and two, it's the case that I always felt that topology overreached, that it tried to explain for things they couldn't explain for. Look, topology is never going to tell you why somebody has depression. It's never going to tell you why people have addictions. It's never going to tell you why, even when I make videos on intuition and melancholia, for example, I'm not basing that off of topology. I'm basing that off of many, many studies in neuroscience that pertain to openness to experience and, neurotic and trait neuroticism and various aspects of personality disorders, things that have to coincide with bipolar mood disorder, schizophrenia, and its relationship to uh, personality dimensions, and also studies that have been done on writers and other creative types that people have found that there tends to be these kind of correlations. And so when I generally notice amongst my intuitive friends that they have some of the same attributes, then I say, let's talk about intuition and melancholia. And that's, you know, 
how I put it, but does do do those ideas germinate from topology? No, because it can't explain that. Then I also thought topology was very behavioristically centric, you know, <laughs> like behaviorism is I don't like it. So part of the reason why I don't like it is because, well, I like it when people know how to, you know, interpret or understand it. You know, it's not like I think all knowledge is a problem. I think knowledge is a tool. I think people misuse these tools. Or when people were coming up with these tools, if they thought that they were the truth, and then they tried to promote them as such, or inflict them on other people. And so I don't like that, but it's more so the case that I understand that behaviorism, for example, is valid from a certain standpoint in terms of a, you know, okay, so I put it like this. You, I think of things in terms of sets very often. And whenever you're looking at a certain set of behaviors and whenever you're looking at a certain set of emotions, behaviorism is absolutely valid. Also, when you're looking at a certain set of phenomena in terms of human behavior, you can use behaviorism to understand them. However, when you're talking about personality, that's where behaviorism, you have to just draw the line. Because behavior and personality are very different things. In fact, if you're asking which one is more complicated, you're talking about behavior rather than personality. Behavior is much more complicated than personality because behavior is contextually dependent so human behavior is very much so it's a lot trickier to pin down let's just put it like that however personality because it's something of an effectual nature and when i say affectual nature i mean something that's based on the emotional landscape of a person in terms of their neurochemical phenomenology that's less, and that's a lot less hard to understand <laughs> because whenever it comes to neurotransmitters in terms of people's, uh, in terms of mammals psychology, they're ubiquitous, okay? And it's the case that whenever you're looking at things like, I guess, personality or affectual dispositions, like whether or not something is disagreeable or something like that, that is not unique to human beings, Okay. It's why people like dogs or tend to personify dogs, that whenever you're looking at personality, it's not something that's localized to human beings. You know, I don't know how that's going to make people feel, but that's just what empirically seems to be the case. So when it comes to understanding something like personality or affectual tendencies, like affectual consistency, whatever emotions this person or this organism readily experiences and expresses... That is a lot easier to understand, and there's many, many examples for scientists to draw from in terms of understanding personality and personality theory. Now, personality theory from a historical standpoint has not been the most, uh, let's say, pristine institution, because there are funny things that happen in psychology. I'm very skeptical of psychology, so don't, don't misunderstand me in thinking that I think psychology is a wonderful thing, but personality as a construct seems to be not only something that appeals to our vanity as uh, creatures, but also something that seems to be a real description of the world whenever you're looking at organisms and in interaction or why it's, it's a good explanatory model. I'm just going to put it like that. And so whenever I looked at most topo topological descriptions of things. I thought, why the hell are these people describing, you know, trying to describe types based on what they do, you know? It's definitely the case that there is similarity among people in terms of their actions and their behaviors and, or their affective makeup. And it's because there's very much similarity across the affective landscape from one personality to the next that various people are going to be drawn to the same activities and the same kind of hobbies and whatever and have the same sets of experiences or move towards the same set of experiences because they have the same effectual trance strands or weather patterns going on in them so that's the way that they're oriented that's the way that they'll move they're motivated to be that way notice how i use the word motivation and motivational landscape when i'm talking about personality because that's what's true about personality however when people start talking about behavior and stuff like that why somebody does something is god knows if you'll ever if you'll ever know you know <laughs> like because people whether people understand this about themselves or not are all individual self-organizing systems because 
whenever you're talking about a human being, you're talking about something that has to live in an environment that's going to change. And so it has to be very plastic and generally random. And so why do so let's talk about why human beings are irrational, because this is important from an empirical standpoint or evolutionary standpoint, a hypothesis I have, I'm not saying you're going to find this somewhere else. But this is generally why I tend to think human beings are rational, or irrational. So or at least, well, okay, whatever. I mean, look, when I say irrational, I mean this. So when somebody says that they want to go to the store, for example, um, there is a, uh, let's say, Kroger's, Ralph's, Vaughn's, whatever you have in your area, and that they could go to that's five miles you know, down the road from their house. If you, if they leave, if this person leaves, you happen to be at the same house as them, and they return back from their store trip with a lay on and a little hula girl in their hand, and you ask them, well, you know, and they've been gone for several days, and you ask them, well, what happened when you went to the store? They said, oh, I went to Waikiki to pick up some coconuts. You're going to think, what? why you, you could have just gone what hold on you know and i'm not saying that it's that extreme with human behavior or human thinking in terms of the fact because it really is sometimes with people's thinking just micro deviations away from what makes sense or what's uh i hate using these expressions but i'll say this so i always have to pick a specific example so say for Oh, oh, da, 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 da. I don't want to do this right now. So I didn't see, and this is what's hard whenever I talk about things. I wasn't trying to have a general philosophical discussion about this, but I think we might as well have it then. Okay, so human beings are rational because they deviate from whatever they establish as their goals and whatever they personally feel, okay? So <laughs> that makes something irrational. And they also tend to be non-contextual or not contextually local so behavior and this is why behavior is funny because it's something that's very based upon context so whether or not you're having a party and there's a bunch of people standing around laughing has a lot to say about whether or not another person is going to laugh or not but also because that person is a self-organizing little system and they could have had some childhood trauma or they have a bunch of biological drives that tend to act themselves out Whenever they want to, they may start crying or start humping the punch. Who knows, man, like when it comes to human beings. But whatever, man, that's how it tends to spring off with human beings. And because they're like that, I just generally say that they're irrational. They don't, they're not consistent with themselves, okay? That's what human beings aren't, okay? Now, why might that be the case? Well, let's just think about it. So you ever notice how rabbits, they seem so... <laughs> <laughs> like a, so they seem so antsy well rabbits are antsy because things prey on them and you notice too when rabbits are antsy they twitch in terms of you don't really know whether or not they're about to move left or right and i know this because i've hunted them so whenever you hunt rabbits you have to be very particular and cautious and cat big cats know cats know this so i watch cats hunt rabbits as well i watch cats hunt other animals in general you know, because it's very interesting to watch. Because one of the things you'll notice about cats is they have very, very long tails. They have soft feet so that they're silent, but they also have these long tails so that they can steer them. Because whenever they're chasing something, the tendency for that thing to move left or right cannot be probabilistically determined. The only thing they can do is react, and that's why most animals are led by their emotions, because whenever something's being hunted, or whenever you're hunting something, the only thing you really have to make a decision are your emotions and your experience, and that's it. And so that's why that's also why human beings tend to be irrational, because we were hunting and hunted things. So also, too, you have to keep in mind that with human beings that we're social animals. So part of the reason why we have, uh, you can see the whites of our eyes, is because we're trying to keep track of what one another is watching. Now, this isn't completely my hypothesis or anything like that. Um, this, I don't remember who came up with this one. Um, 
I want to give this to Franz Duol, but that just may not be true. So I'm not really sure, because he actually deals mostly with primates. So, I mean, I've read a lot of things. Okay, look, man, I can't, like, put a finger on exactly who, you know? And you'll hear it in various sources. I mean, Robert Sapolsky talks about it. Jordan B. Peterson talks about it. They both got it from somewhere. I don't know, man. Like, but I remember reading this. I remember reading this in another source, but whatever. So if it shows up in multiple sources, I tend to hold on to it. Um, but anyways, this... Okay, so we can see we have whites in our eyes so that we can keep track of one another. It's also why whenever human beings are about, about to pay attention to something, that the eye has all of these micro deviations before it locks on to something. Partly because things can move, you don't really know which direction that they're going to go in. And two, you may not want people to know what you're looking at because perhaps you and that person want the same things. Um, it's also the case that human beings are not angels. And so if somebody's completely predictable, they're also very killable, <laughs> you know? If you know where they're going to be at this time and so on and so forth, you know how to hunt them down. <laughs> it's very easy, you know? That's why um, uh, sloths, they, st they stay in trees <laughs> mostly because they're slow and they're predictable. So, you know, sloths have variation to them, but they're not going to do 101 crazy things. So, you know, their adaptations are different than other animals. It's why also, too... If you find a sloth on the ground, that's where they get killed the most because, well, they adapted differently to the environment, which means, which that is all meant to kind of indicate or point towards making an inductive argument here, that the reason why human beings are irrational is because the world is a dangerous place. Human beings are, other, are dangerous animals, and they would like to do dangerous things to other people and other animals. So we have to be kind of like, uh -huh, you know un inconsistent with ourselves or else we wouldn't have made it this far so you know i can't say that there's something necessarily wrong with irrationality it's just the case that irrationality does not seem to be very profitable when it comes to trying to understand something from a general standpoint or when it comes to trying to understand something from i don't want to say objective but that's just the classical word that we use. So what I mean by objective is just that you want to analyze the thing from the standpoint that it exists in the world independent of you. It's not something because you want it to be that thing, but it is something because it happens to be that thing. It just is that way. And you want to understand that way because, well... Either you're highly curious or you have a goal to solve. And anytime you want to think of this thing in terms of your culture's interpretation or something of it, it always has limiting effects, you know? It doesn't seem to work. Every time you try to use whatever everybody else is doing, it's like it falls short, which is why it's the case that you have specialized people doing things like medicine or science because everybody's going to have their homeopathic remedies and things like that things that work for them, but if you want something that's going to work for a human being in most cases and scenarios, then you need a professional. Because most people don't care. Most people don't research things thoroughly. They don't think about things thoroughly enough. And they don't think about things, I wouldn't say from a disinterested standpoint, but from a standpoint interested in something else besides whatever it happens to be their appetites, social motivations, or something like that. And it doesn't mean that I don't experience these things. What I'm saying is I'm very aware of the fact that I experience these things. So I watch out for them or I do things to make it such that it's less likely that I would act in this way or feel this way or something like that. It's also one very particular in being honest with myself because I don't ever lie to myself about how I feel or think about something because that's going to have consequences that is going to make it th that I think will make it less likely that I'm able to arrive at some reasonable conclusion about something that I care about in the world. And so I just try not to be dishonest with myself. Now, all that, all that is to say that me being on YouTube has a lot less with, you know, informing people about a particular thing. <laughs> I can't tell people really what I'm up to because I don't know necessarily myself. I just know that 
oftentimes whenever I encounter ideas or explanations about this or that, I think that they're wrong or they're limited. And if something's limited and doesn't mean necessarily it's wrong, so long as it's consistent with itself, though there are many times where people present ideas like systems in terms of MBTI where they're not self-consistent, similar with theology or the Bible. And I mean, people have heard what I have to say about Christian metaphysics and theology, you know. There are plenty of Christians that bastardize Christianity, and in fact, I'm fairly convinced that Christians killed Christianity, not everybody else, you know. Um, it's the case that I tend to just not like that, <laughs> you know. I just tend to not like inconsistency with an idea, because if it's inconsistent, then chances are it cannot explain something <laughs> you know, it can't explain something in a way in which you can make predictions about it, really, I guess, is the thing that, you know, <laughs> people, that human beings would care about. And is prediction the measure of all things? No, but it's just a case that when it comes to thinking, you want to think so that you can come to a conclusion about something. Why do you want to come to a conclusion? Maybe so that you can predict something, maybe for the... And when I say predict something, it just means that, you know... You know when you turn on the stove, you know when you turn the dial on the stove, the light is the the light on the stove is generally going to flare up into verifying magnitudes of brightness or the flame is going to increase in varying magnitudes of brightness depending on how far you ratchet the knob. And if you ratchet the knob far to the I think it's depending on what kind of stove you own, what kind maybe what country you're in. Ratchet it far to the right gets bright as it can get, or the flame gets as uh, blazing as it could be, and as you go to the left, it turns off, or it gets dimmer. So that's, I mean, a conclusion, but you want to know that so that whenever you go to cook something, you know, well, hell, I need to have it at relatively this consistency or something like that. That's the point of knowledge. Knowledge is just a tool, but... I find oftentimes that people, because they're into knowing things for various reasons, they want to sound smart, they want to win a debate, they want to feel like an intellectual, they want to feel like they understand science because, you know, science is very hyped right now and it's popularity. There's a lot of reasons, you know, people want to appear a certain kind of way, or they don't want to lose ground in some you know, struggle for social power or something like that. There are, there are a lot of motivations for why people come to various conclusions at any point in time. However, I would say this, that for all of those things, they tend to be very, very, very disappointing whenever, for all of those things in terms of the knowledge or the conclusions that people come to, whenever they're in the state of these emotions, they tend to be very disappointing whenever you really want to figure something out or, or when you really want to do something. Like, say you want to send somebody to the moon. Well, thinking that it's made out of cheese is not fucking helpful. I don't care how cute it is. You know, it's like, it's just not, it just doesn't help. And so I don't like those things, you know? I don't like those things. It doesn't mean when it comes to, I guess, thinking, but... It doesn't mean that irrationality is not valuable, you know, I understand the upside of irrationality, and I understand the value of irrationality. I just think that I am very much so aware of, as Dan Irely would put it, the predictive irrationality of human beings more so than other human beings seem to be. You know, I don't believe I'm rational. I don't believe any other person is rational. And so when I'm on YouTube, I'm being contrarian to kind of make people come face to face with the fact that maybe you didn't think about this or had you considered this or did you realize or did you know, you know, just how cognizant were you? How thorough were you? Did you do the due diligence? Did you, what did, what was going on? You know, just don't be so sure you know the truth, man. Don't be so sure that you got it right. Just don't be so certain about that. You know, I even think, you know, when it comes to me and other people, look, though, I'll say this very quickly. I don't have to know what's true in order to know that something's not right. It's not correct. It's not accurate from a technical standpoint and from a pragmatic one. That just doesn't make any fucking sense. So just because I don't know what the truth is doesn't mean that you know either. Like, just because I can't give you an alternative does not mean that your position is valid. 
Though that's what I very much so feel like. Everybody, a lot of, not everybody, but a lot of people are like that. And so, yeah, so, I guess I, the INFJ videos have inspired a lot of this musing and thinking. Um, because there's a lot of mixed, <laughs> I get a lot of mixed reviews on those things. And I'll tell you this, look, I'm not trying to be a YouTuber for a general audience. That's just not my interest, and I've said that on many, many occasions, because why? Well, um, usually <laughs> most people are not interested in thinking. They're just really not interested in thinking. And most of what I ask people to do is to think, you know, it's to consider this, you know. It's why it just doesn't come out very easily. And it's also why it's the case that you know, I may not exactly have the most linear presentations, partly because I don't write these things out. <laughs> you know, I don't have a script. So why don't I use a script? Let's just talk about that because there's a YouTube video out there about, you know, me being I'm a chameleon or something like that, assholes, whatever. Um, here we go. Why don't I use a script? Because one, whenever you write things out, you know, writing as... So this is what I think here when it comes to ideas and what I understand about the psychology of writing. Whenever you're not certain of something, do not write it down. Well, okay, so maybe you want to write it down. So if, okay, I'll put it like this. If you're not certain of something, say like a mathematical equation or a mathematical proposition, you can come to some conclusion about it if you write it down and start playing or messing with the thing. But generally, in most other situations and scenarios, or if you're formally trained in logic, or you're studying philosophy, if you have something delineated already that you're trying to analyze, writing it down is good. However, I think whenever I look at people, <laughs> whenever I talk to them, that most of the times, People are coming to conclusions while they're speaking. They don't really know fundamentally what they think completely or totally about something. And so whenever somebody's writing a script, usually what they do is grab a lot of facts and they write what they already think down. And in that process of writing down those facts and writing what you already think is true, you make a psychological imprint or an emotional imprint in your mind that that is indeed the case. And I don't ever want to be the type of person that just thinks that something has to be indeed the case because whenever, because you happen to be a tool-based thing, you know, the more you do something with your body, the more your mind tends to think that that is what's going on or that's a description of reality or that's the case. I'm not saying it's precisely like that, but that's just what empiricism tends to show. So whenever I'm doing my videos, I do have ideas. Sometimes I'm amending these ideas during the video. Sometimes I already have a predetermined idea. I'm about to say it, but then I think, oh, wait a minute. I didn't realize this whenever I came to this conclusion before. I probably shouldn't say that, not until I've investigated it further, or it just doesn't seem true or right right now. And there's a lot of things like that. It just has to go back on the shelf. Doesn't mean I'm not going to come back to it or something like that, but it's all a work in progress. I, I guess I would say this. I do not want to bullshit people. I'm not so concerned with popularity enough to in, infringe my own ideation and bullshit people about the truth, you know? And I don't want to just talk about things, too, that are already well established, you know? It's just not, there's no point in that. You know, I think there are a lot of people that do things like that already, and they make a lot of money off of it and everything like that. You know, they're pretty, the market is pretty set on that one. You know, that's just not what I'm here to do. So that's why I don't use a script. And also because I find it much more challenging not to use a script. Um, I like something to be a challenge just because I don't like to be bored. So <laughs> that's just how it goes. I don't know. So no, it's not completely. One part of it is rational. Another part of it's not rational. And I've never been the one to say that I'm a rational person. But I would say that's why I don't have a script, you know. And if it's the case that the unedited, unscripted, uh, I guess, uh, 
not easily accessible nature of my videos bothers a person, don't fucking watch them, you know? I don't want everybody to watch them in the first place, you know? It's like, that's the point. It's all the point. To me, there's something wrong with everything. And maybe we just don't look at what's wrong with everything. You know, I want to make people look at it or consider it. Maybe there's nothing wrong with something at all. And, you know, I just have, I'm just too bored and my mind's too active. And you know what? Somebody can say, Joshua, well, here's what's wrong with your argument. And I'll listen to it and I'll consider it and I'll think about it. And if they're, you know, logical, I'll be like, okay, that's what's wrong with my argument. You know, and move on, you know? That'll be the that'll be the case, you know, because I prefer not thinking something than thinking something that tends to be incorrect, you know. And that's you know that doesn't mean I'm looking for the right answer. I'll put it like that. That's not that's not what I'm doing because well, the right answer is something of a social convention, and I mean I'm not here to say that everything that culture or uh, your society has deemed as accurate is just all horseshit. What I am here to say is that whenever they're coming up with those things, that in those ideas, even our scientific institutions, whenever they were coming up with those things, they had different goals in mind. Maybe they weren't aware of what they had in mind, but there were a lot of different competing factors that they had in mind, and so this was the best that they can do. That doesn't mean the story is over. That doesn't mean that we have to stop thinking about it, and, you know? It looks like, to me, people just don't want to think, and so I don't ever like the idea that thinking is unnecessary in the world, or human beings aren't needed to think about things. Partly also, too, why I don't like AI, because I would have nothing to do, you know? <laughs> you know, if it was made to be such a uh, technology that could do our thinking for us, it's like, oh, fuck, I was... I don't like that one. Um, but anyway, so that was rather long. And so I guess I'll call this why the hell I'm on YouTube. So thank you for watching. It was long. Bye.